Yeah. You know, it's one thing if you want to talk about what, what should or shouldn't be in the curriculum, and that's a good debate to have. I have my views on civic education in this country. I don't think we do enough of it. But the basic question of a parent having the ability to know right. whether their kid yeah. has either been taught or is re-identified yeah. as a gym. To knowledge. You think of school as a black box. Where right. You're just supposed to drop your kid and so, but I think that's the brilliance of that bill here, yeah. is you've set it up in a way that I think, you, yeah, I don't know what the people in the elected chambers would say, but most of their constituents who are parents would say they're in that same camp, right? And so, I, you know, if I can be helpful on that, you let me know when the next time you have a joint session. It, it's, it's a basic point of, let's put aside what your differences are on whether you like what's being taught or not. We will have that debate. But on the question of whether you're a blue, a blue voting parent or a red voting parent, you still, as a parent, not as a politician, get to know exactly. You have responsibility and accountability. And part of what this does is it also creates a culture of, and I don't know if people have already made this point, probably have, but it creates the beginning of a culture where parents then have less responsibility. Right? Because if, if the state and the culture create a point that says, well, you, the parent, can't even know, we're going to talk about that fatherlessness epidemic in the country. You want to talk about the decline of the two-parent household. You want to talk about a decline of parents getting involved in their kids' education. A good way to do that is to shut them out, make them feel alienated, right? And so that's another dimension of this is that's not immediate, but over a 10-year time horizon, over 10, 20 years, if you tell parents, you, know, you can't know what's happening in the school, then a lot of those parents, especially poor areas, et cetera, become more disengaged. So that's another aspect of this that I think probably should be discussed. School choice is also an easy one, or should be an easy one to get there on. I grew up in California, and I remember the librarian at our high school was uh, escaped from Cuba, and she told me that they, the government takes the children away when they're this big and indoctrinates them to be communists. That's how it works. So it's not that different. Right. Not that different in China under the Red Guard. Not that different from much of USSR under Stalin. I mean, history teaches us. It's not like it's not like we have to imagine how this might play out, right? We have history that tells us how this plays out when you have a one-sided agenda that takes over what Mao called the long march through institutions. But now it's just up to us to wake up and act. And it seems like that's what you guys are doing. If you're able to get it done. Right, but common sense doesn't tend to play well to some. Yeah, I think we could change that. It sounds so simplistic, and there's there's always that pushback, and, it, and it's the plan. It's the, the guidebook. To, yeah, I mean, some of it's the federal yeah. government, too. I mean, you, you want to take the school choice piece of this. I just mentioned this to the group downstairs, to the, to the Senate. The U.S. Department of Education, the amount of damage they do to this country... It's invisible, but it actually creates the incentives that these schools respond to. Because effectively, they're saying, even to, to the schools governed by the laws you're passing, they don't get federal funds unless they adopt Agenda A, Agenda B, Agenda C, radical race, radical gender, et cetera. And so there's a reason. I'm not saying that the school boards are doing the right thing, but there's a reason it's built in the shadow of an incentive system created by the federal government that we feed with federal tax dollars. So that's a big reason why I always point out this is an all-hands-on-deck moment, right? The U.S. president can't fix everything on his own. State legislators can't fix everything on their own. Parents in their own individual capacity outside of politics can't fix everything on their own. It's going to take everybody stepping up to do their part if we actually want to revive this country. And so for my part, I'll shut down the Department of Education. We'll take that $83 billion and... If there's underfunded school choice or whatever the best objection would be, great. That's a better use of capital than flowing it through that federal bureaucracy. So let's have that conversation. We're talking about school shootings. Put three armed security guards in every school in the country. There's your school shooting problem solved right there. It's not by, in my opinion, not by taking away guns from law-abiding adults. But that's a federal government problem. So, so that's got to go hand in glove with the agendas that you know, we actually want to implement through the states as well. And so I view us as, if we're successful in this race, occupying the White House, I view us as really as partners, right? Because not all of it's going to happen from the White House. In fact, most of it's going to happen from the states, but there is a job for the federal government to get out of the way and to also 
set the tone for what the culture across the country needs to be. And then, you know, that's up to you guys to then implement that into, into law. So keep up, the great, keep up the great work on that. Well, we're trying like hell. You, you focus on this ESG, on these, some of these ESG-related issues? Yes, I've been doing workshops on that. Oh, you are? Okay, good. Very, very concerned. Yeah. I, I, we we if did I, pass a bill in the House last term, but um, it, was, it was held over in the Senate. Yeah. So, so one, one area to pay attention to there is the way that the pension fund capital is voted. So you familiar with this? You guys, you're all are familiar with this issue? Pretty Roughly, much. yeah, okay. Yeah, environmental social governance. So basically, the gist is using pension fund money and other 401k, other retiree money to advance political agendas that cause corporations to adopt political agendas rather than passing them through Congress. So give you examples, you know, tell a corporation it can't, tell a bank that it cannot lend to a gun manufacturer, tell or, or a do business with a coal company. Coal has become, in the figurative sense, a four-letter word in this country. Even oil and gas are now in that category. So the way the debate's played out is, right now they say it's about, oh, you're not lending to oil companies. But that's not the, actually the biggest problem. It's a small part of the problem. The biggest problem is they're using pension fund money in New Hampshire to literally vote as shareholders for policies at companies like Apple and Home Depot and Chevron. So Apple and Home Depot right now are conducting uh, racial equity programs in their company ranks that the CEO and the board actually didn't want to pursue. But the reason they're pursuing it is that their largest shareholders are voting for those policies anyway. Who are those shareholders? They're firms like BlackRock, but whose money are they managing? Pension funds like those in New Hampshire. So that's what people don't realize is it's not just the way their money's being invested. It's the way their money's actually being voted, right? So that's something that um, that's something that hasn't really received nearly as much attention as it should. But if people knew, again, it's not it shouldn't be a Republican or Democrat issue. Whether you're Republican or Democrat, you want to make as much money as you possibly can through your pension accounts, not vote for political policies. That's what this building's for. So that's you know one of these other kind of invisible cultural issues where. I'll tell you what I said downstairs to the folks in the Senate is it probably isn't a time in our life when state legislators can actually have more of an impact on American culture than you all can right now. I think there have been points where the issues that the you know, states dealt with were, were important, but managing, you know, day-to-day -day related kitchen table issues, economy, et cetera. Those are all very important. But in terms of driving change or revival of American culture itself, I think it's in the hands of state legislators across this country, including states like this one. Let me ask you your thoughts on this. Um, we see what's coming out of states like California, you know, New York. Um, you know, they want this basically to shut down any internal combustion motor, mm -hmm. you know. And they've got these horrific ideas that think everybody's going to have a windmill in their backyard. That's right. Or solar panels on their house. How do you stop when you've got, even though it's a minority of the states, but a majority of the population? Like, you know, California, Illinois, New York, New Jersey, you know. Connecticut, they've got a, a huge, Washington, Oregon, they've got a huge population, but not the same amount of states. See where I'm going? Yeah, yeah. So how do, how do, you, how do you think we can um, stop that kind of absolute nonsense? Well, the ESG piece is important, right? So, so the way this works is CalPERS, which is the California Pension Fund, near, manages well over half a trillion dollars, maybe nearly a trillion dollars. They're the ones that give money to these big financial institutions that then buy up shares in these companies. But CalPERS makes a demand on these financial institutions. Not a lot of people know this. What they say is, we're not going to give you our money unless you make a total commitment to the Paris Climate Accords, to net zero standards by 2050, to these emissions caps. And so then what do they do is they get to say, it's not just that they're the biggest states and the biggest dogs. They're effectively using money from the red and purple states too, 
to implement their own agenda just because they were the biggest dog in the house, right? And it's a form of bullying, really. Mm -hmm. So I think that some of this ESG, some of these ESG issues are just pure defensive issues for for states, for red and purple states, even some blue states maybe that would not want this ag agenda enforced on them. Now, a big part of this is the federal government again, though. So, so again, there's no silver bullets where the states can do it on their own. I think states can play defense to prevent somebody else from dragging you guys along to advance an agenda that actually hurts people in the state of New Hampshire. But a big part of this is the federal government. I mean, the standards imposed by mandates from the Biden administration on the, via the EPA, via the Department of Labor, and that's why I'm in this race. We need to, here's what I've said, and it makes a lot of people mad when I say this. We need to abandon the climate cult in this country. I think Republicans are too shy on this issue. They feel like they don't want to be called a, a rude name, like a climate denier. I, I know, I happen to know a lot about this issue. I could go on for hours about it. Oh, is it? Well, we fight back, yeah. Oh, good. Good. I mean, just some basic, basic points here. The climate disaster-related death rate so how many people die from a climate disaster? It's down by 98% over the last century. So if 100 people died in 1920, two of those deaths occur today. You don't hear that in the climate narrative. Why is it? Because of the use of fossil fuels to power greater buildings, temperature regulation, the kind of technology that actually allows us to live a modern life. That's what they're coming after. So my view is, Call that bluff for what it is, because the entire federal government is using the power of the purse to basically, same thing as the education, Department of Education, bully around states as well. So part of it, states need to be, and it sounds like you are, to have a spine to say, no, we will not stand by and be dragged along by your agenda, California, thank you very much. But part of it's coming from on high from the federal government. And that's, that's why I'm in this to fix. You get in the White House, you actually need, and, I, and I, look, I'm just gonna be really honest with you. I think that there's roles where you need experience, uh, and then there's the roles where you actually just need somebody who's coming in as an outsider. I think the president of the United States, at least in this moment we live in, I think it was true in 2016. I think it's true today. It's a place where right now you need an outsider who's actually go get that job done. It's not going to happen by somebody just being a little caretaker of the administrative state and then some other puppet comes along four or eight years later. That isn't, that's not going to solve the problem. Willingness to take toxic government agencies, shut them down. To say that actually it's the will of the people that runs this country, not the administrative state. To actually say, you know what, there's all these carbon intensity standards. Yeah, we can have some sort of debate around the edges about time horizons to climate change as opposed to call the bluff and say that is the wrong framework. We're focusing on economic growth and human flourishing, period. I'm biased because I am an outsider, but I'm in this race because I am. I think it takes an outsider to get that job done. I don't think it's going to be done by somebody who grew up within that system from, from the White House. Then you need people in legislative bodies, et cetera, who have experience of understanding how to translate that into, you know, into statute, both at the state and federal level. So there's a role for all of us is the way I look at it. So you guys know, uh, you guys know, you guys know Fred and you see him all the time. Kathy's uh, on my team as well. We're, we're all ears. You tell us, what do you, what do you think we need to do to be successful here? Because Frankly, success in New Hampshire is core to our... Uh, success in New Hampshire is, like I mentioned to you earlier, uh, you, you, pe people here, we've had the you know, person in the nation primary for so long. Yep. Uh, the old saying is you've got to meet the person six times before they'll make up your mind, make up their mind, and that's not too far from the truth. Yep. You know, you've got to just keep meeting them and meeting them, and um, uh, some people will jump on board right away. And some people will just, the old Yankees will say, yeah, haven't met them enough. You know, yeah. got to meet them a few more times. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's just the way it is in New Hampshire. But that's what makes us so special is uh, whoever comes out of New Hampshire has probably met everybody a number of times. Yep. Plus, that's why we're going to keep coming back. Uh, yeah. The, uh, you know, obviously your, uh, you know, your ideas and everything else, but it's, it's, get it's, allowing people to get to know you and meet you and, uh, you know, on a, basically a one-to-one -one basis. Yeah. We'll, we'll be doing a lot of small, that. Small town halls, Perfect. house parties, stuff like that. Perfect. That's, that's how you win New Hampshire. We'll be doing it. Yeah. I, uh, I enjoy it, actually. Funny enough. Yeah, I didn't realize. I didn't realize it. I just started doing this. But actually, you meet the people of the country as opposed to just the, you know, bureaucratic or political consultant class or whatever. That's, 
that's what reminds you why we're doing what we're doing. Yeah. And that's what it takes in New Hampshire. Yeah, <laughs> it's good. It's good. And, we're we're going to be doing that, I think. We're, we're, yeah. we're the small enough state where you can do that compared to a California or a New York or something where, you, you know, wouldn't be. It's actually it's possible. actually why it's a useful state for it to remain first in the state, first in the nation primary. It can play a function not just for New Hampshire, but for the entire country. We bet you're pretty good. It's pretty good. It, it's a service. <laughs> it's a service to the country. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Well, tell me what you, um, you know, if there's something you, you think that I ought to be focused on that's important and near and dear to your guys' hearts, New Hampshire's heart, not just right now, but, but even as you think about it, stay in touch. Let us know. We're here to represent the will of the people. It's with the consent of the governed. It's what it means to be in, you know, in American political life, right? It's what it means to be American. We live in a self-governing constitutional republic. That means having our ear to the ground and understand where the people are. And so you'll hear what I'm talking about, but I want to hear in reverse what we'll you guys give, are focused on. We'll give Fred our Christmas card. This. That's good. That's good. That's what we'll take. That's what we'll take. And we'll be, you know, it's going to take all of us to make this happen. I said this downstairs too. I say it all the time is there's no, you know, I think some people run for president. You want to be a Messiah figure from on high. Nobody's going to actually, as an individual, save this country. It's going to take all of us to make it happen, right? If this is going to happen, it's going to be bottom up where every one of us is doing our respective parts, state legislator, county council, president of the United States, local business leader, doing a good job, making a good product for people who need it. Everybody's got to play their, their role. And so that's, for my message is, it's about the vision. It's not even about me. It's not about you. It's not about you. We're just, we're just vehicles. We're just sitting here temporarily. Yep, exactly. To get, our, to get the actual job done, to get the vision turned into reality. That's where my focus is. And so you're going to, the sense you'll get from me maybe a little bit different than some of the others who I think are more focused on the vertical pronoun, you know, I. Sure, I'm in this because I believe I can get that job done. Yes, I'm an outsider. Yes, I've built multi-billion dollar businesses. I know how to tackle bureaucracy, but this isn't about me. Get rid of it. It's about the vision. Exactly. It's that simple, right? It takes a private sector mentality sometimes to, to, do, to do that. But it's going to take every one of us doing our part. Oh, yeah. And that's going to be the, the tenor of this campaign. Right? It's going to be grassroots movement, not a top-down edict, someone coming from on high. I don't think that's the model for actually getting the job done and going further. And I'll tell you this, I didn't say it downstairs, but I, I mean, I voted for Trump in 2020, big supporter of him, been, been a big supporter of him. You know, Fred obviously has been on, on Team Trump for a while. You know, the America First agenda, it doesn't belong to Donald Trump. It doesn't belong to me. It doesn't belong to you didn't belong to you, didn't belong to you, it didn't belong to anybody. It belongs to the people of this country. And it wasn't born eight years ago. It was born in 1776, actually. And so if we want to put America first, let's rediscover what America is. But if we do that, then I think we can take the America first agenda further than even Trump did. Reagan actually was able to do that in the 1980s with moral authority with moral conviction right doing it based on principles not just based on vengeance and grievance vengeance and grievance can get you so far it can get the thing kick started a little bit that'll take you so far if you want to get the job done you're going to go the distance i think you have to be grounded in moral conviction and principle i think that's what's going to be different in the way that it's not, it's not so much the agenda that's actually that different. It's the way we get it done. And I think we can do for the country in 2024 what Reagan did in 1980. He led the country out of a national identity crisis. That's what made him a hero. He answered what it meant to be American. Now we're in our next national identity crisis right now. I think 2024 can be the year out of it. And if we want to take on some of these, they'll call me extremist sometimes for the things I'll say about climate change or race-based affirmative action or even some of the trans ideology that's now making its way through our school system. If you really want to have a mandate to take it on, it can't just be a razor thin. I mean, I think this has got to be a 1980 style, 1984 style, Reagan style mandate to actually get that done.
And I don't, I don't think there's anybody else in the Republican Party, including even the front runner right now, Donald Trump, who's going to be in a position to get that kind of electoral mandate. If you're doing it based on principles with that mandate, you can go further with the same agenda. That's why I'm in this. So we would appreciate your support in the movement. And it's not even about me. It's about what we're getting done. Fred's here. I'm going to be back. We'll all be back. But, uh, you know, these are your colleagues. But I think that you guys are, yeah, you guys are inspiration. What you're doing, I'm following from afar. We're watching it very closely, and it's exactly where we're going to be back. So you tell me if I can be helpful. Sure. So, uh, Vivek, uh, I agree with you completely about needing to have principles behind. Yeah. And I think that's where the last president failed to a great degree. But you, we saw what happened when he ran up against the entrenched administrative state. Oh, yeah. And what they did to him. Like, do you, do you worry about what's going to happen to you as well, personally? And how do you imagine being able to do a better job? Of, yeah. Uh, of, and the do you worry question, I'll, I'll answer you very honestly. I do. It's not, not something that we're going to take. It's not for the faint of heart. They will, I mean, if you go at them hard, they will come back with equal force. Right? That is the nature of this entrenched administrative state. So here's the difference, though. I think we can't just talk a big game. Teddy Roosevelt said it, right? Speak softly, carry a big stick. I think right now we have a lot of leadership that speaks loudly and carries a small stick. I think we're in a moment where you just speak loudly and carry a big stick. What does that mean? It means you can shut these agencies down. I don't think you can reform them. I think that was Trump's mistake. He thought you could put Betsy DeVos on top of the Department of Education and reform it. This is, this is the Leviathan. Right. The, the U.S. federal government, the alphabet soup that is the administrative state today, probably have a version of it here in New Hampshire. That is the Leviathan. That is the monster. That is the beast. You're not going to tame that beast. You might be able to, to drain the beast, but you're not going to tame it. And so my view is we'll go in there and shut it down. Now, the conventional view is you can't do that because of civil service protections and all of these book, laws in the books that say you can't be fired. Well, you know, this is where somebody with a constitutional understanding and a deep respect for the Constitution and the principles actually helps. Actually, I read Article 2 of the Constitution pretty darn closely. Turns out a lot of the Supreme Court jurisprudence, study the people on the current Supreme Court. They agree with my view on this. So we'll shut it down. We'll get sued. We'll take that to the Supreme Court. And now with the current composition of the court, I'm confident we'll win. And you know what we do then? Then it's codified in precedent. So now the next president, whoever that's going to be, doesn't have to deal with the same thing that Donald Trump did or that I will have to in the first stage of getting this done. But, but I think that's what it's going to take to go the distance, right? You can't just rail against, you know, you can chant lock her up as much, many times as you want. You know, you eventually backed off of that anyway, because if you're just based on vengeance and grievance, you're not going to have the mandate electorally or morally to get it done. But if you're grounded in principle, you can go miles further than Donald Trump ever did with the same agenda, by the way, which is why I voted for him. But I think that now, we, now it's a sense of frustration that we are where we are. I mean, even he's a victim of it. The police party, and I, I've been the biggest critic of this in the race, of anybody in the race, I've been the critic of the politicized prosecution of my competitor in this race. It's wrong. But in some ways, it's exhibit A of the fact we didn't actually solve the problem. We pointed it out, but we didn't solve it. And he himself is the victim of that. The question is, do you actually want to solve the problem? Do you want, do you want to complain our way into a national divorce or do you want a national revival? I'm running to lead a national revival. I think we can actually, this is, the, this is the funny part about this. If you go unapologetic, all out on that America first agenda and take it further, I think you even unify the country. You actually get into stranded independents, Democrats, probably a lot of people in this state that don't identify politically one way or another, independents, whatever you want to call them, behind a movement that says the country and the principles of the country is actually what we believe in. So, so that's, the, that's where, that's where Traditional politicians think small ball. Oh, if I'm going to go further, no, no, no. How I get unity is I got to compromise a little bit. No, no, no. I think that's all wrong. You go even further unapologetically with the American agenda, you actually bring people along. People follow an actual leader as long as that leader is not doing it based on their own personal grievance and their personal vengeance. That was Trump's problem. And so it's not, you know, DeSantis will, you know, kind of be Trump light or, you know, with competence. No, it's not that with the political experience. That's the wrong way to go. I think the right way to go is to say we're going to go further. 
further than we ever have, but we will. And the bet we're making here is not, it's going to be a good bet. It'll pay off for the country. Is we will unite the nation in the process. And then we'll look back at the era we lived in for the last 10 years and laugh about it. Say, okay, we went through a little bit of uh, teenage years as a country, adolescence. I can't wait to get to that yeah, point. we will get there. Thank you, Mr. We will get there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the time, guys. Thank we'll, you. We'll, we'll be looking for, your, looking for your partnership through this entire process. We welcome that. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that.